The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde Chapter 4 One afternoon a month later, Dorian Gray was reclining in a luxurious armchair in the li a little library of Lord Henry's house in Mayfair. It was, in its way, a very charming room, with its high-paneled wainscoting of olive-stained oak, its cream-colored frieze and ceiling of raised plasterwork, and its brick-dust felt carpets strewn with silk-long fringed Persian rugs. On a tiny satinwood table stood by stood a statuette by Clodion, and beside it lay a copy of Les Cent Nouvelles, bound for Margaret of Valois by Clovis Eve and powdered with the gilt daisies that that queen had selected for her device. Some large blue china jars and parrot tulips were ranged on the mantel shelf, and through the small uh, leaded panes of the window streamed the apricot-colored light of a summer's day in London. Lord Henry had not yet come in. He was always late on principle, his principle being the punctuality as the thief of time. So the lad was looking rather sulky, as with listless fingers he turned over the pages of an elaborately illustrated edition of Manon Lescaut that he had uh, found uh, in one of the bookcases. The formal monotonous ticking of the Louis XIV clock annoyed him. Once or twice he thought of going away. At last he heard a step outside, and the door opened. "'How late you are, Harry,' he murmured. "'I am afraid it is not Harry, Mr. Gray,' answered a shrill voice. He glanced uh, quickly round and rose to his feet. "'I beg your pardon. I thought you thought it was my husband. It is only his wife. You must let me introduce myself. I know you quite well by your photographs. I think my husband has got seventeen of them.' "'Not seventeen, Lady Henry. Well, eighteen, then. And I saw you with him the other night at the opera.' She laughed nervously as she spoke, and watched him with her vague forget-me-not eyes. She was a curious woman, whose dresses always looked as if they had been designed in a rage and put on in a tempest. She was usually in love with somebody, and her passion was never returned. She had kept all her illusions. She tried to look picturesque, but only succeeded in being untidy. Her name was Victoria, and she had the perfect mania for going to church. That was a Lohengrin, Lady Henry, I think. Yes, it was a uh, dear Lohengrin. I think of Wagner's music better than anybody's. It is so loud that one can talk the whole time without other people hearing what one says. That is a great advantage. Don't you think so, Mr. Gray? The same nervous staccato laugh broke from her thin lips, and her fingers began to play with a long tortoiseshell paper knife. Dorian smiled and shook his head. I'm afraid I don't think so, Lady Henry. I never talk during music, at least during good music. If one hears bad music, it is one's duty to drown it in a conversation. Ah, that is one of Harry's views, isn't it, Mr. Gray? I always hear Harry's views from his friends. It is the only way I get to know of them. But you must not think I don't like good music. I adore it, but I am not afraid of it. But I am afraid of it, rather. It makes me too romantic. I have simply worshipped pianists, two at a time sometimes, Harry tells me. I don't know what it is about them. Perhaps it is that they are foreigners. They all are, ain't they? Even those that are born in England become foreigners after a time, don't they? It is so clever of them and such a compliment to art. It makes it quite cosmopolitan, doesn't it? You've never been to any of my parties, have you, Mr. Gray? You must come. I can't afford orchids, but I spare no expense in foreigners. They make one's room look so picturesque. But here is Harry. Harry, I came in to look for you to ask you something. I forget what it was. And I found Mr. Gray here. We have had such ple a pleasant chat about music. We have quite the same ideas. No, I think our ideas are quite different. But he's been most pleasant. I'm so glad I've seen him. I am charmed, my love, quite charmed, said Lord Henry, elevating his dark crescent-shaped crescent eyebrows and looking at them both with an amused smile. So sorry I'm late, Dorian. I went in to look after a piece of old brocade in Water Street and had to bargain for hours for it. Nowadays, people know the price of everything and the value of nothing. I am afraid I must be going, exclaimed Lady Henry, breaking an awkward silence with a silly sudden laugh. I've promised to drive with the Duchess. Goodbye, Mr. Gray. Goodbye, Harry. You were dining out, I suppose. So am I. Perhaps I shall see you at Lady Thornbury's. 
I dare say, my dear, said Lord Henry, shutting the door behind her as looking like a bird of paradise that had been out all night in the rain. She flitted out the room, leaving a faint odor of frangipani. Then he lit a cigarette and flung himself down on the sofa. Never marry a woman with straw-colored hair, Dorian, he said after a few puffs. Why, Harry? Because they are so sentimental. But I like sentimental people. Never marry at all, Dorian. Men marry because they are tired. Women because they are curious. Both are disappointed. I don't think I'm likely to marry, Harry. I am too much in love. That is one of your aphorisms. I am putting it into practice, as I do everything that you say. Who are you in love with? asked Lord Henry after a pause. With an actress, said Dorian Gray, blushing. Lord Henry shrugged his shoulders. That is a rather commonplace debut. You would not say so if you saw her, Harry. Who is she? Her name is Sybil Vane. Never heard of her. No one has. People will some day, however. She is a genius. My dear boy, no woman is a genius. Women are a decorative sex. They never have anything to say, but they say it charmingly. Women represent the triumph of matter over mind, just as men represent the triumph of mind over morals. Harry, how can you? My dear Dorian, it is quite true, and analyzing women at present, so I ought to know. The subject is not so abstruse as I thought it was. I find that ultimately there are only two kinds of women, the plain and the colored. The plain women are very useful. If you want to gain a reputation for respectability, you merely have to take them down to supper. The other women are very charming. They commit one mistake, however. They paint in order to try to look young. Our grandmothers painted in order to try to talk brilliantly. Rouge and Esprit go together. That is all over now. As long as a woman can look ten years younger uh, than her own daughter, she's, she's perfectly satisfied. As for conversation, there are only five women in London worth talking to, and two of these can't be admitted into decent society. However, tell me about your genius. How long have you known her? Ah, Harry, your views terrify me. Never mind that. How long have you known her? About three weeks. And where did you come across her? I will tell you, Harry, but you mustn't be unsympathetic about it. After all, it never would have happened if I had not met you. You fill me with a wild desire to know everything about life. For days after I met you, something seemed to throb in my veins. As I lounged through the park or strolled down Piccadilly, I used to look at everyone who passed me and wonder, uh, with a mad curiosity, what sort of lives they led. Some of them fascinated uh, me, others filled me with terror. There was an exquisite poison in the air. I had a passion for sensations. Well, one evening about seven o'clock, determined to go out and search for some adventure, I felt that this grey, monstrous London of ours with its myriads of people, its sordid sinners and its splendid sins, as you once phrased it, must have something in store for me. I fancied a thousand things. The mere danger gave me a sense of delight. I remembered what you had said to me on that wonderful evening when we first dined together about the search for beauty being the real secret of life. I don't know what I expected, but I went out and wandered eastward, soon losing my way in a labyrinth of grimy streets and black grassless squares. About half past eight, I passed by an absurd little theatre, with great flaring gas jets and gaudy playbills. A hideous Jew, in the most amazing waistcoat uh, I ever beheld in my life, was standing at the entrance, smoking a vile cigar. He had greasy ringlets and an enormous diamond, diamond blaze in the center of a soiled shirt. Have a box, my lad, he said, when he saw me, and he took his hat off, uh, he, he took off his hat with an air of gorgeous civility. There was something about him, Harry, that amused me. He was such a monster. You will laugh at me, I know, but I really went in and paid a whole guinea for the stage box. To the present day, I can't make out why I did so, and yet if I hadn't, my dear Harry, if I hadn't, I should have missed the greatest romance of my life. I see you are laughing. It is horrid of you. I am not laughing, Dorian. At least, I am not laughing at you. But you should not say the greatest romance of your life. You should say the first romance of your life. You will always be loved, and you will always be in love with love. A grande passion is the privilege of people who have nothing to do. That is the one use of the idle classes of a country. Don't be afraid. There are exquisite things in store for you. This is merely the beginning. Do you think my nature is so shallow? cried Dorian Gray, angrily. No, I think your nature is so deep. How do you mean? 
My dear boy, the people who only love once in their lives are really the shallow people. What they call their loyalty and their fidelity, I call either the lethargy of custom or their lack of imagination. Faithfulness to the emotional life, what consistency is to the light. Faithfulness is to the emotional life, what consistency is to the life of the intellect. Simply a confession of failure. Faithfulness. I must analyze it some day. The, patient for, uh, the passion for prosperity is in it. There are many things that we would throw away if we were not afraid that others might pick them up. But I don't want to interrupt you. Go on with your story. Well, I found myself seated in a horrid little private box with the vulgar drop scene staring me in the face. I looked out from behind the curtain and surveyed the house. It was a tawdry affair, all cupids and cornucopias like a third-rate wedding cake. The gallery and pit were fairly full, but the two rows of dingy stalls were quite empty, and there was hardly a person in what I suppose they called the dress circle. Women went about with oranges and ginger beer, and there was a terrible consumption of nuts going on. It must have been just like the palmy days of the British drama. Just like I should fancy, and very depressing, I began to wonder what on earth I should do when I caught sight of the playbill. What do you think the play was, Harry? I should think the idiot boy or dumb but innocent. Our fathers used to like that sort of piece, I believe. The longer I live, Dorian, the more keenly I feel that whatever was good enough for our fathers is not good enough for us. In art, in, as in politics, les grands-pères ont toujours tort. This play was good enough for us, Harry. It was Romeo and Juliet. I must admit that I was rather annoyed, at the, rather annoyed at the idea of seeing Shakespeare done in such a wretched hole of a place. Still, I felt interested, in a sort of way. At any rate, I was determined to wait for the first act. There was a dreadful orchestra presided over by a young Hebrew who sat at the cracked piano that nearly drove me away. But at the last drop scene, at last the drop scene was drawn up, and the play began. Romeo was a stout elderly gentleman with corked eyebrows, a husky tragedy voice, and a figure like a beer, a figure like a beer barrel. Mercutio was almost as bad. He was played by the low comedian who had introduced gags of his own and was uh, was on most friendly terms with the pit. They were both as grotesque as the scenery, and that looked as if uh, and that looked as if it had come out of a country booth. But Juliet Harry, imagine a girl, hardly seventeen years of age, with a little flower-like face, a small Greek head with plated coils of dark brown hair, eyes that were violet wells of passion, and lips that were like the petals of a rose. Eyes. No, she was the loveliest thing I had ever seen in my life. You said to me once, the pathos left you unmoved, but that beauty, mere beauty, could fill your eyes with tears. I tell you, Harry, I could hardly see this girl for the mist of tears that came across me. And her voice, I never heard such a voice. It was very low at first, with deep, mellow notes, and seemed to fall singly upon one's ear. Then it became a little louder, and sounded like a flute, or a distant haute bois. In the garden scene, it had all the tremulous ecstasy that one hears just before dawn when nightingales are singing. There were moments later on when it had when it had the wild passion of violins. You know how a voice can stir one. Your voice and the voice of Sybil Vane are two things I shall never forget. When I close my eyes, I hear them, and each of them says something different. I don't know which to follow. Why should I not love her, Harry? I do love her. She is every, everything to me in life. Night after night, I go see her play. One evening, she is Rosalind. And the next evening she is Imogen. I have seen her die in the gloom of an Italian tomb, sucking the poison from her lover's lips. I have seen, I have watched her wandering through the forest of Arden, disguised as a pretty boy in hose and doublet and dainty cap. She has been mad and has come into the presence of a guilty king and given him rue to wear and bitter herbs to taste of. She has been innocent, and the black hands of jealousy have crushed her reed-like throat. I have seen her in every age, in every costume. Ordinary women never appeal to one's imagination. They are limited to their century. No glamour ever transfigures them. One knows their minds as easily as one knows their bonnets. One can always find them. There is no mystery in any of them. They ride in the park in the morning and chatter at tea parties in the afternoon. 
They have their stereotyped smile and their fashionable manner. They are quite obvious. But an actress, how different an actress is. Harry, why didn't you tell me that the one thing worth loving is an actress? Because I have loved so many of them, Dorian. Oh, yes, horrid people with dyed hair and painted faces. Don't run down dyed hair and painted faces. There is an extraordinary charm in them sometimes, said Lord Henry. I wish now I had not told you about Sybil Vane. You could not have helped telling me, Dorian. All through your life, you will tell me everything you do. Yes, Harry, I believe that is true. I cannot help telling you the things. I cannot help telling you things. You have a curious influence over me. If I ever did a crime, I would come and confess it to you. You would understand me. People like you, the willful sunbeams of life, don't commit crimes, Dorian. But I am much obliged for the compliment, all the same. And now tell me, reach me the matches like a good boy. Uh, thanks. Uh, what are your actual relations with Sybil Vane? Dorian Gray leapt to his feet with flushed cheeks and burning eyes. Harry, Sybil Vane is sacred. It is only the sacred things that are worth touching, Dorian, said Lord Henry, with a strange touch of pathos in his voice. But why should you be annoyed? I suppose she will belong to you some day. When one is in love, one always begins by deceiving oneself, and one always ends by deceiving others. That is what the world calls a romance. You know her at any rate, I suppose. Of course I know her. On the first night I was at the theatre, the horrid old Jew came round to the box after the performance was over, and offered to take me behind the scenes and introduce me to her. I was furious with him and told him that Juliet had been dead for hundreds of years, and that her body was lying in a marble tomb in Verona. I think, from his blank look of amazement, that he was under the impression I had taken too much champagne or something. I am not surprised. Then he asked me if I wrote for any of the newspapers. I told, him, I told him no, I never even read them. He seemed terribly disappointed at that, and confided to me that all the dramatic critics were in a conspiracy against him, and that they were every one of them to be bought. I should not wonder if he was quite right there, but on the other hand, judging from their appearance, most of them cannot be all expensive. Well, he seemed to think that they were beyond his means, laughed Dorian. By this time, however, the lights were being put out in the theatre, and I had to go. He wanted me to try some cigars that he strongly recommended. I declined. The next night, of course, I arrived at the place again. When he saw me, he made a low bow and assured me that I was that I was a uh, munificent patron of art. He was a most offensive brute, though he had an extraordinary passion for Shakespeare. He told me once, with an air of pride, that his five bankruptcies were entirely due to the bard, as he insisted on calling him. He seemed to think it a distinction. It was a distinction, my dear Dorian, a great distinction. Most people become bankrupt through having invested too heavily in the prose of life. To have ruined oneself over poetry is an honor. But when, when did you first speak to Miss Sybil Vane? The third night. She had been playing Rosalind. I could not help going round. I had thrown her some flowers, and she had looked at me. At least I fancy that she had. The old Jew was persistent. He seemed determined to take me behind, so I consented. I was curious, my not wanting to know her. It was curious, my not wanting to know her. Wasn't it? No, I don't think so. My dear Harry, why? I will tell you some, I will tell you some other time. Now, I want to know about the girl. Sybil? Oh, she was shy and so gentle. There was something of a child about her. <clears throat> her eyes opened wide in exquisite wonder when I told her what I thought of her performance, and she seemed quite unconscious of her power. I think we were both rather nervous. The old Jew stood grinning at the doorway of the dusty green room, making elaborate speeches about us both, while we stood looking at each other like children. He would insist on calling me my lord, so I had to assure Sybil that I was nothing of the kind. She said quite simply, simply to me, You look more like a prince. I must call you Prince Charming. Upon my word, Dorian, Miss Sybil knows how to pay compliments. You don't understand her, Harry. She regarded me merely as a person in a play. She knows nothing of life. She lives with a mother, a faded, tired woman who played Lady Capulet in the sort of magenta dressing wrapper on the first night, and looks as if she had seen better days. I know that look. It depresses me, murmured Lord Henry, examining his rings. The Jew wanted to tell me her, her history, but I said it did not interest me. 
You were quite right. There is always something infinitely mean about other people's tragedies. Sybil is the only thing I care about. What is it to me where she came from? From her little head to her little feet, she is absolutely and entirely divine. Every night of my life I go to see her act, and every night she is more marvelous. That is the reason, I suppose, that you never dine with me now. I thought you had some curious romance on hand. You have, but it is not quite what I expected. My dear Harry, we either lunch or sup together every day, and I have been to the opera with you several times, said Dorian, opening his blue eyes in wonder. You always come dreadfully late. Well, I can't help going to see Sybil play, he cried, even if it is only for a single act. I get hungry for her presence, and when I think of the wonderful soul that is hidden away in that little ivory body, I am filled with awe. You can dine with me tonight, Dorian, can't you? He shook his head. Tonight she is Imogen, he answered, and tomorrow night she'll be Juliet. When is she Sybil Vane? Never. I congratulate you. How horrid you are! She is all the great heroines of the world in one. She is more than, indivi than, than an individual. You laugh, but I tell you she has genius. I love her, and I must make her love me. You, who know all the secrets of life, tell me how to charm Sybil Vane to love me. I want to make Romeo jealous. I want the dead lovers of the world to hear our laughter and grow sad. I want a breath of our passion to stir their dust into consciousness, to wake their ashes into pain. My God, Harry, how I worship her! He was talking up and down the room as he spoke. Hectic spots of red, burn, of red burned on his cheeks. He was terribly excited. Lord Henry watched him with a subtle sense of pleasure. How different he was now from the shy, frightened boy he had met in Basil Hallwood's studio. His nature had developed like, uh, developed like a flower, had borne blossoms of scarlet flame. Out of its secret hiding place, hiding place had crept his soul, and desire had come to meet it on the way. "'And what do you propose we do?' said Lord Henry at last. "'I want you and Basil to come with me some night to see her act. I have not the slightest fear of the result. You are certain to acknowledge her genius. Then we must get her out of the Jew's hands. She has bound him for three years.' at least two years and eight months, from the present time. I shall have to pay him something, of course. When all that is settled, I shall take a West End theatre and bring her out properly. She will make the world as mad as she has made me. That will be impossible, my dear boy. Yes, she will. She has not merely art, consumer at art, instinct in her, but she has personality also. And you have often told me that it is personalities, not principles that move the age. Well, what night shall we go? Let me see. Today's Tuesday. Let us fix tomorrow. She plays Juliet tomorrow. All right. The Bristol at eight o'clock. And I will get Basil. Not eight, Harry, please. Half past six. We must be there before the curtain rises. You must see her in the first act where she meets Romeo. Half past six. What an hour. It'll be like having meat tea or reading an English novel. It must be seven. No gentleman dines before seven. Shall, see, shall you see Basil between this and then, or shall I write to him? Dear Basil, I have not laid eyes on him for a week. It is rather horrid of me, as he has sent me a, my portrait uh, in the most wonderful frame, specially designed by himself, and, though I am a little jealous of the picture for being a whole month younger than I am, I must admit that I delight in it. Perhaps you had, you had better write to him. I don't want to see him uh, alone. He says things that annoy me. He gives me good advice. Lord Henry smiled. People are very fond of giving away what they need most themselves. It is what I call the depth of generosity. Oh, Basil is the best of fellows, but he seems to me to be just a bit of a Philistine. Since I have known you, Harry, I have discovered that. Basil, my dear boy, puts everything that is charming in him into his work. The consequence is that he has nothing left for life but his prejudices, his principles, and his common sense. The only artists I have ever known who are personally delightful are bad artists. Good artists exist simply in what they make, and consequently are perfectly uninteresting in what they are. A great poet, a really great poet, is the most unpoetical, unpoetical of all creatures. But inferior poets are absolutely fascinating. The worse their rhymes are, the more picturesque they look. 
The mere fact of having published a book of second-rate sonnets makes a man quite irresistible. He lives the poetry that he cannot write. The others write the poetry that they dare not realize. I wonder if that really is so, Harry, said Dorian Gray, putting some perfume on his handkerchief out of a large gold-topped bottle that stood on the table. It must be, if you say it. And now I am off. Imogen is waiting for me. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't forget about tomorrow, rather. Goodbye. As he left the room, Lord Henry's heavy eyelids dropped, and he began to think. <coughs> Certainly few people had ever interested so much as Dorian Gray, and yet th the lad mad's adoration of someone else caused him not the slightest pang of annoyance or jealousy. He was pleased by it. It made him a more interesting study. He had always been enthralled by the methods of a natural science, but the ordinary subject matter of that science had seemed to him trivial and of no import, and so he had begun by vivisecting himself, as he had ended by vivisecting others. Human life, that appeared to him as the one thing worth investigating. Human life, that appeared to him as the one thing worth investigating. Compared to it, there was nothing else of any value. It was true that as one watched life in its curious crucible of pain and pleasure, one could not wear over one's face a, a mask of glass, nor keep the sulfurous f fumes from touching the brain and making the imagination turbid with monstrous fancies and misshapen dreams. There were poisons so subtle that to know their properties one had to sicken of them. There were maladies so strange that one had to pass through them if one sought to understand their nature. And yet... What a great reward one received! How wonderful the whole world became to one! To note the curious hard logic of passion and the emotional colored life of the intellect, to observe where they met and where they separated and at what point they were in unison and at what point they were in discord. There was a delight in that. What matter was the, uh, what matter was what matter what the cost was? One could never pay too high a price for any sensation. He was conscious, and the thought uh, brought a gleam of pleasure into his brown, agate eyes. That it was through certain words of his, musical words said with musical utterance, that Dorian Gray's soul had turned to this white girl and bowed in worship before her. To a large extent, the lad uh, was his own creation. He had made him premature. There was something. That was something. Ordinary people waited till life disclosed to them its secrets. But to the few, to the elect, the mysteries of life were revealed before the veil was drawn away. Sometimes this was the effect of art, and chiefly of the art of literature, which dealt Im immediately with the passions and the intellect. But now and then a complex personality took the place and assumed the office of art. It was indeed, in its way, a real work of art. Uh, life, having its elaborate masterpieces just as poetry has, or sculpture, or painting. Yes, the lad was premature. He was gathering his harvest while it was yet spring. The pulse and passion of youth were in him, but he was becoming self-conscious. It was delightful to watch him. With his beautiful face and his beautiful soul, he was a thing to wonder at. It was no matter how it all ended or was destined to end. He was like one of those gracious figures in a pageant or a play whose joys seemed to be remote from one but whose sorrows stir one sense of beauty, and whose wounds are like red roses. Soul and body, body and soul, how mysterious they were! There was animalism in the soul, and the body had its moments of spirituality. The senses could refine and the intellect could degrade. How co who could say where the fleshly impulse ceased, where the physical impulse began? How shallow were the arbitrary definitions of ordinary psychologists? and yet how difficult to decide between the claims of various schools. Was the soul a shadow seated in the house of sin, or was the body really in the soul, as Giordano Bruno thought? The separation of spirit from matter was a mystery, and the union of spirit with matter was a mystery also. He began to wonder whether he could make, ever make psychology so absolute a science that each little spring of life would be revealed to us. As it was, we always misunderstood ourselves, and rarely understood others. Experience was of no ethical value. It was merely the name men gave to their mistakes. Moralists had, as a rule, 
regarded it as a mode of warning, had claimed for it a certain ethical efficacy in the formation of character, had praised it as something that taught us what to follow and showed us what to avoid. But there was no motive power in experience. It was as little of an active cause as conscience itself. All that it really demonstrated was that our future would be the same as our past and that the sin we had done once and with loathing we could do many times and with joy. It was clear to him that the experimental method was the only method by which one could arrive at any scientific analysis of the passions, and certainly Dorian Gray was a subject made to his hand and seemed to promise rich and fruitful results. His sudden mad love for Sybil Vane was a psychological phenomenon of no small interest. There was no doubt that curiosity had much to do with it, curiosity and the desire for new experiences. Yet, it was not a simple, but rather a very complex passion. What there was in it, of the purely sensuous instinct of boyhood, had been transformed by the workings of the imagination, changed into something that seemed, to the lad himself, to be, to be remote from sense, and was, for that very reason, all the more dangerous. <sighs> it was the passions about whose origin we deceived ourselves that tyrannized most strongly over us. Our weakest motives were those of whose nature we were conscious. It often happened that when we thought we were experimenting on others, we were really experimenting on ourselves. While Lord Henry sat dreaming on these things, a knock came to the door, and his valet entered and reminded him that it was time to dress for dinner. He got up and looked out into the street. The sunset had smitten into scarlet gold the upper windows of the houses opposite. The panes glowed like plates of heated metal. The sky above was like a faded rose. He thought of his friend's young, fiery-colored life and wondered how it was all going to end. When he arrived home, about half past twelve o'clock, he saw a telegram lying on the, t on the hall table. He opened it and found that it was from Dorian Gray. It was to tell him that he was engaged to be married to Sybil Vane. End of chapter four. See ya.